So, welcome to this introduction to CodeSyn. I'm Adam Thornhill, and I'm the author of Your Code as a Crime Scene. And based on the ideas in that book, we formed a company called Ampere to develop the CodeSyn tool. CodeSyn is available in two versions. One is the cloud-based version, the tool as a service at CodeSyn.io, and the other one is the on-premises version of CodeSyn. And I'm going to walk you through some of the highlights of the tool. CodeSyn is a web-based tool, which means you install it on your laptop or in your data center, and then you access it through a simple web browser. And what you see here is CodeSyn running in Chrome. Now, each one of those boxes that you see here represents an open source project that I use for the demo. Now, let's focus on one of the larger ones. Let's focus on Erlang. So we click on that tile and we get to the dashboard that shows the analysis result highlights. Now, Erlang is the implementation of the programming language with the same name, together with its library. And we see that Erlang, if you look at the tile to your left, you see that Erlang is a fairly large code base. It consists of two and a half million lines of code. And the majority of that code is implemented using Erlang itself. So this is a bootstrapped technology. We also note that this code base is developed by more than 400 different authors. And given this combination of two and a half million lines of code and 400 offers, who has the overall picture? Probably no one, and at the same time, everyone. Because each developer sits on their own unique piece of information of the overall code base. So what CodeSyn does is that it aggregates the collective intelligence of all contributing offers and look for patterns in that data. And I want to show you now how CodeSync can be used to identify and prioritize technical debt. Our starting point here is something called a hotspot analysis. So we click on this hotspots tail. And this is what two and a half million lines of code look like. This is the Erlang code base. And I want to walk you through the visualization here. First of all, we see those large blue circles here. Each one of those represents a folder in the code base. So this is a hierarchical visualization that will follow the folder structure of your code. You can also click on one of those folders and zoom in to any level of detail that you want. And if you do that, you see that each file is represented as a circle too. And you note that the circles have different size. That's because the size of a circle is used to express the amount of code inside that file. So the larger a circle, the more source code inside that file. You also note that the circles tend to have different colors here. That's because color is used to express the change frequency. That is, how often do we have to work with each piece of code? And that's a heuristic we're going to use to reason about the interest rate of technical debt. Now, let's zoom out to the top level in Erlang again. And note that there's lots of potential hotspots in here. You see all those large red circles? Each one of them could be a hotspot. Now, where do we start? CoSyn helps you by providing something called prioritized refactoring targets. So we just click on the tab here in the top menu. And what happens now is that CoSyn runs a machine learning algorithm that knows how to prioritize technical depth. So this input is based on a lot of evolutionary factors of the piece of code. How does its complexity evolve? How many different programmers are involved? How significant is this piece of code from architectural perspective? And much more. Anyway, this leaves us with a cluster of prioritized hotspots over here in a package called Beam. So let's zoom in on that one. And let's investigate the top hotspot, the red one here. Click on that one. And we see in the information box to your right that this file or process is a file with close to 12,000 lines of code. We also see that this file has a really high change frequency. There have been almost 300 commits to this file over the analysis period. And then we also see a bunch of social information here that we're going to cover later. Let's ignore that for now and focus on the technical aspects. Once we have identified a hotspot, our next question is, how bad is it? Is this code that we actually already know about and have started to improve by doing focused refactorings, or is it code that just keeps accumulating complexity? 
To answer those questions, we use CodeScene's Complexity Trends Analysis. So we click on the Trends button here. And what CodeScene does now is that it pulls out each historic revision of that code and calculates its complexity evolution. And we see that there are two lines here. The blue line shows the accumulation of lines of code over time. And an interesting note here is that we see that over the past five years, this file started from 7,000 lines of code and is now close to 12,000 lines of code. So it has actually accumulated 5,000 lines of code over the past years. A bit more serious is the red line. That shows the code complexity at each point in time. And we see that it's actually been increasing quite a lot until earlier this year, there seems to have been a focused refactoring that actually managed to reduce the complexity. So this shows that you can actually use complexity trends to follow up on the refactorings that you do and see that you get the real effect. But our process is still a hotspot, and it has 12,000 lines of code, so we probably should do some more targeted refactorings. Now, where do we start? Where do we start amongst those 12,000 lines of code? This is the question that Cosins tried to answer with X-ray analysis. To run an X-ray, we just click on the file name here of the hotspot, and what happens now is that Cosin runs exactly the same analysis, but now on a function level. So this means that Cosine parses your code and looks at in which functions do each commit hit. And the X-ray results, they serve pretty well as a prioritized list of refactoring targets. In this case, uh, we have quite an extreme example here. The number one hotspot on a function level is a function called ERTS schedule. Sounds like a central part of a process. We see that it has accumulated 185 commits. So this is a function that has been changed a lot. And we pretty much see why in the next column that shows that this function has over 700 lines of code. That's quite a lot for a single function. And we can, of course, from here, we can dig a bit deeper. We can look at the complexity trend of the individual function, or we can jump directly to the code and have a quick look at it and see that, yes, indeed, it's actually quite tricky. And since we, we work with it a lot, the function could probably benefit a lot from introducing some simplifications, like perhaps extracting a bunch of methods and try to work away with the excess accidental complexity of it. Now, one thing I want to point out is that 700 lines of code, that's actually quite a lot. Usually the top hotspots on a function level are much smaller, but I still want to point out that 700 lines of code is much less than 12,000 which was the size of the total file. And it's definitely less than 2.5 million, which was the size of the total system. So more important, we're now on a level where we can act upon the information. But X-Ray also provides an analysis that may give you some really quick wins. This is something called internal temporal coupling, so let me click on that tab and walk you through the results. Now, Internal temporal coupling is about finding patterns in how different functions evolve together. So the way to read this is that if you look at the first row here, you see that we have two functions, schedule dirty CPU thread and schedule dirty IO thread. And we see that those two functions, each time you make a change to one of them, you have a predictable change in the other one in 100% of all cases. So these are two functions who evolve together all the time. And we see here that this has happened a lot of times, 51 different revisions. And the possible explanation for that is found in the final column here called similarity. This is CodeScene's copy-paste detection algorithm. And we see that those two functions have a code similarity of 95%. This sure sounds like copy-paste that matters. So let's click on the compare that button and have a quick look. Oh yeah. We see here that the major reason that these two are changed together, the only differences basically, are here in the trace messages, where one says CPU and one says IO. So this is probably code that you can extract into a shared abstraction and thus break the temporal coupling and have less code to maintain, which is always a good thing. So far, I've showed you some of the technical aspects on a file and function level. CodeScene applies the same concept to an architectural level too, and this is particularly useful if you have larger software systems. For example, microservice architectures. 
And I can demonstrate the same thing here on Erlang. So we just click on architecture and we see that we have hotspots there too. So let's click on the hotspots. The difference now is that each circle here doesn't represent a file. No, it represents a complete subsystem. So this is an aggregation of all the individual files inside a particular component or subsystem. And we can of course click on one of them and see that yeah, we get a complexity trend on that level too, which allows us to supervise the growth of a complete system. Another interesting thing is when you start to add the team dimension. Erlang is an open source project, so it doesn't have teams in that formal sense. So what you will see next is a little bit of a contrived example. But I think it's enough to illustrate the general principle. Let's click on the Conway's Law analysis. So Conway's Law is about the principle that the project works best when its architecture is aligned with the way the people who work upon it are organized. And what you see in this analysis is that each team, each development team, have been assigned a unique color. And the team members who have written most of the code in a particular subsystem get their color on that part in the diagram. Now, this reveals quite a different view of the code base compared to what we're usually used to reason about. This shows the distribution in effort amongst the different development teams. And really good starting point here is the choice called coordination needs in the top menu. So let's click on that one. What happens now is that CodeSyn identifies parts of the code, different subsystems, where multiple teams need to coordinate their work all the time. So the more red something is, the more work in parallel on a component. So let's click one of them. Here for example, here's the kernel module. And we see that there are four different teams that work on this code all the time. And if we want to know how the work is distributed, we click on the Teams button here, and we see that the main team is something called a legacy team, whatever that is. Second team is Ericsson Personnel, and the third team is the third party contributors. And then we also have a bunch of people who we hadn't assigned to a team yet. Now, this is data that you use to get feedback on how well your architecture supports the way you are organized. And you may use this data either to make technical changes like splitting a large subsystem into multiple parts so that different teams can operate it on, in parallel, or you may use it to perhaps introduce a new team into your organization to take on a shared responsibility. CodeSyn also provides something called a knowledge loss analysis. This is something we can do on a subsystem level, but I want to show you how to get really detailed data here. here. So we go down to the social analysis, click on individuals. Now, what this map shows is, is a view where each programmer gets assigned a color, as shown in the right-hand side, and the developer has written most of the code, gets the color of that particular file. CodeSyn also lets you add information to the analysis. One example is if you have a developer who's leaving your organization, perhaps to work on a different project or take on another job, what you do then is you go into CodeSyn and mark that developer as an ex-developer. The moment you do that, CodeSyn looks at the potential knowledge loss in terms of code ownership once that developer leaves. So let's click on the knowledge loss tab here. And we see that the red parts shows abandoned code in case one specific person leaves. This is something that you can use to reason about risk. It's also quite useful to use during onboarding. So in this case we see that there's one particular part here called libsrc that will get abandoned to a large extent. So that probably means you want to make sure someone else learns a little bit about that code before this developer leaves. CodeSyn has much more to offer and this demo has really just scratched the surface. One thing I haven't talked about at all is CodeSyn's different early warning systems. For example, all of that stuff I've been talking about, like hotspots, complexity trends and uh, delivery risks, it's something that CodeSyn can calculate for you and supervise for you. So, in case you have files that suddenly start to accumulate a lot of complexity, CodeSyn will detect that and inform you about it. Here's one example for Erlang. Oh yeah, we see that indeed 
There seems to have been a major addition of complexity to this file quite recently, which is Codesyn's way of saying, hey, have a look at this file and see if this is okay or if it may be a potential future problem. And if you want to know more about Codesyn, you can either try it out in the cloud as a service, you just go to Codesyn.io and it's there, or you can contact us to get more information about the on-premises version of Codesyn. Also make sure to look up Empire.com where we have some blog posts presenting different case studies and also a bit more information about the products. Thanks a lot for listening and may the code be with you.